Life is good, huh? All right. Talking about frustrating the grace of God and Him wanting to wanting to bless us, huh? No, it says in Malachi, he says, man, you're robbing me in your tithes and offerings. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I want to be able to bless you, but you're not functioning in the kingdom. I'm frustrated. I want to give you super abundance. I want to open up the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing. You can't contain it, but you won't operate in the kingdom of God. And you can hear the frustration in God's voice, you know, towards the Israelites. It's like going, come on, guys. Ah, I need your faith, you know. Amen. All right. Well, praise God. Um, we're going to be, let's, let's go to uh, Deuteronomy 30, 19. That's been a foundation scripture that we've been uh, into here. Father, we thank you and praise you for this message. Thank you, Lord, for your word in our lives. You've been teaching us how to operate in the kingdom of God and not in the kingdom of darkness, that we be loyal to the kingdom of God. And how do we do that? And what does that look like versus falling trapped to the kingdom of darkness and falling victim to the assets of that kingdom. Help instruct us in this today and further our education and our revelation in it in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, let's, uh, as a, like a review here, Deuteronomy 30, 19. Deuteronomy 30, 19. Does I call heaven and earth as witness to uh, 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 heaven, let me read that again. I can do this. I call heaven and earth as witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. In other words, he wants to give you the to live a full kingdom life. That's his purpose. Notice that he's wanting you to make the right choice. He's not trying to hold out and try to trick you on the choice. He gives you the answer. This is the easiest test that you could take, huh? You have to fail this one on purpose, don't you? <laughs> you do. That you, that, uh, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey His voice, and that you may cling to Him, for He is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land in which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to give them. And what we've been talking about here is there are two kingdoms, isn't there? There's two kingdoms. And what's being talked about here is they need to make a choice between those two kingdoms, don't they? There's the heaven, the life, the blessing kingdom. You might call that the faith kingdom because faith is what activates that kingdom. But there is another kingdom at play here. It's an earth, death, and cursing type of kingdom that's out there vying for you. And that is the fear kingdom. And fear is what activates that kingdom. And so we want to walk by faith and not by fear. Amen. We don't want to let fear rule and reign in our hearts because that kind of perverted faith activates the kingdom of darkness. And the kingdom of darkness then what? Causes still kill and destroy in our lives. But Jesus says, I've come to give you another kingdom. Amen. John 10.10. 10. Come to give you life and give it to you in abundance. In fact, in the, in the Amplified, it says, to the overflowing. And that's the plan. That's God's end game in this thing. He says, choose life. Choose the kingdom of heaven. Walk by faith. And in case you don't know which kingdom to pick, I gave you the answer. To you choose the kingdom. Satan can't choose that for you. God can't choose that for you. Understand that as they were standing there, only they could make that quality decision of what they're going to go. And that's it for us too. God can even tell you which, what the right answer is, but if you are dog determined to go for the wrong answer, there's nobody can stop you from doing it. It's kind of crazy to, to pick the wrong answer, but... Uh, <laughs> I don't know. You'd be surprised. You know, you spend some time with people and you, and you counsel with them and you, you know, man, you're going off to the kingdom of darkness. You pull back, pull back, and they'll dog determine, no! I'm going to blame God and I'm going to... 
I said, well, okay, I guess the conversation is over. You have a nice life, thank you. You can't minister to that. They're dog determined. 2 Corinthians 10. Another verse that we've been studying here. 2 Corinthians 10, 3. For though we walk in the flesh, though we're in these flesh and blood bodies, right? Though we're walking in this, we do not war after the flesh. This is not our battle. Sure, it's now we're talking about this whole coronavirus and the whole governmental thing and all the goofy stuff that's going on. I mean, you just watch the news and your head spins. It's like the stuff that's going on in our government and all the stuff that's happening right now. It's like, and they think they're in total control because they're walking in a, in a uh, flesh realm, this physical realm of existence. That's what they're operating in. But you know, the bottom line is we're not wrestling against flesh. This is a spiritual warfare. You know, they think that they're doing everything by their will. They're not. They're being manipulated by a kingdom of darkness out there that's pushing and shoving them around to do their bidding. Amen. If you look at it from the spiritual realm, you almost get a heads up on where, the, where all this garbage is going. Amen. I, you know, I mean, we can go a step further. And, uh, you know, they might kick me off YouTube for this. <laughs> but I'm on to your game, man. In the spirit realm, we know what the end game is here. If this is a spirit realm battle, then ultimately what's the kingdom of darkness wanting to shut down? Uh, football games? Movie theaters? What are they wanting to shut down? They're wanting to shut down the church. That's what they're, at, uh, that's what they're after. That's what they're after. They might not even know that consciously, but because they're being manipulated by the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of darkness is interested in this. They're at, they're, he's after us. That's who he's really after, to shut us down. Now, if it takes shutting down stadiums and shutting down movie theaters and shutting down this and that, just to justify them shutting down this venue, the devil don't care what the collateral damage is. As long as he gets his deal done. Amen. See, when you're thinking spiritually minded, when you're thinking there's two kingdoms at play, when, when, when that's how you look at it, then you follow the end game of, well, what does the devil like? What he don't like? What's he really after here in these last of the last days? That's the end game to all this. And we're going to have to, we're, and there's spiritual warfare. This. So even though we walk after the flesh, that's not where our battle is. I'm not duped into believing that, well, you know, it's just every, you know, they're just trying to, for health reasons, they're trying to, no, they're after the church and they shut the church down. We're, we are long past on the other side of this curve. <laughs> you couldn't, I mean, if I've been this any long, I mean, we've bent this so much it's snapping. It's, you know, it's cracking. We can hear the crack of the, of the bend, right? I mean, it, 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 it's over. But they're going to still, because the devil's after the church. He's after closing the church, keeping the church closed. Praise God that we are not going to bend to that. Amen. Hallelujah. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So we don't have to roll over. If you're in the kingdom of God, then you need to, as you stand in the kingdom of God, you need to take that and fight against the kingdom of darkness. And you can declare it. You can fight. We don't have to roll over. Our weapons are not down here. We can take authority from here. See, so you're in a unique position because you, have a, because you have bodies in this earth, you have authority on this earth. And I can pull His kingdom come, His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, today, I can do that. That's where our battle is. I'm not saying you couldn't go out there and wave signs around. I guess yesterday they were out there protesting on the streets about opening up the businesses and all that kind of stuff. But a more powerful, when you know that the enemy 
is something of the spiritual realm, that's where you, we do our battle in there. And that's much more powerful. When they're in our presence, the demons cry out. <laughs> they go, oh no, have you come to torment us before our time? <laughs> you know, the demons are scared of us. The kingdom of darkness is afraid of us. When you get a revelation of this, you know, I mean, you're on their turf when you're battling down here. When you get here, they're in trouble because the devil's already been defeated. That kingdom's already been defeated. Amen. So you will cast down imaginations. Look at that. You cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And this is something that we're going to talk about today. How do you do that? Not a carnal, but a spiritual warfare. Casting down imagination, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every what? Thought to the obedience of Christ. So there is a spiritual warfare, and it's not with signs, it's not with guns, it's not with anything earthly. It, it, the, we have a soul, and that's where the battlefield lies. And we need to align ourselves with the proper kingdom. If that kingdom can create fear in you and anxiety in you and, and worry in you, then the kingdom of darkness has already won the battle, the spiritual battle. But if we walk by faith and take the word of God and begin to meditate on it and begin to build that on the inside of us to where worry and fear and anxieties is not the plan, it's not what resides on the inside of us, we start walking by faith, we are dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. We become dangerous in the real, the real fight is, and that's in the spirit realm, isn't it? So our five physical sense gates are not our final analyst of any situation. Isn't that right? Though we have been trained in such senses from the time we were born, we need to get a different mindset, don't we? We do. In every area of our life, we have to understand that our warfare isn't this earth. Our warfare is in the spiritual realm. So this is not a flesh and blood war. Warfare is not carnal. Invisible kingdoms are at play here. And you know what? If you've got a deliberate revelation of that, you can begin to operate in a higher spiritual plane. And you don't just have to roll over with any circumstance that comes into your life. Amen. This, now, this is good revelation. We've got to figure out how to get there. How are we going to get there? Because we are plagued with the things that we see, things we're exposed to. So, how do we. How do we overcome those things? If we are not kingdom-minded, then we are earth-bound. We don't have the high ground. See, any military general will tell you that, the, that, the, the, that if you're in a military conflict, that he who owns the hill has a huge advantage. That's why they built fortresses. That's why they built walls around the cities. That's why they built castles. That's why they built, because any enemy that attacks you, you can clamp on the wall and have the high ground. And it's a lot harder. You're going to lose way more men trying to take a castle than to defend it. Amen. So it's a big deterrent, isn't it? So how do we take the high ground? How do we get there? We're so these next few weeks, we're going to be talking about different elements that's going to give us the high ground and give us the advantage in the spirit realm to where we can be victorious and put the devil to waste. Amen. We don't have to be subject to the virus. The virus is subject to us. Amen. So let's go to Joshua 1.5. Let's start it off here. Joshua 1.5. God gave Joshua an outstanding revelation of how to overcome a seemingly overwhelming task that he set before him. But to overcome this task, he's going to have to not allow himself 
to be caught up in fear, be caught up in the kingdom of darkness, because the kingdom of darkness is not going to deliver the, the, deliver the promised land into his hand. He's got to stand in the kingdom of God and the supernatural power there. See, God's aware. He says, look, you've got to stay in the spiritual realm, Joshua. You've got to stay on the kingdom of God's side and be walking in faith and be trusting me if you're ever going to go into these fortified cities that seemingly have an advantage over you because they got the high ground. But you've got a higher ground. What ground is that? Heaven. It's higher than any wall there is on this planet. I don't care if the, them in the Tower of Babel out there in the Valley of Shinar, I don't care how high they built that tower, it will be higher than what God's vantage point is. You can't build a wall tall enough or thick enough to overcome the vantage point of heaven, of the kingdom of God. So he's encouraging Joshua to stand in that realm so that he can do something that could not be accomplished in the earth. Because if he limited himself to flesh and blood to conquer the kingdom, you know, the, the prom, the, to get the promised land and what God had delivered into their hands, all, and I mean, he's already said, it's yours. You just got to walk in and take it. If they're going to do that, they can't do it with flesh and blood. Amen. The ten uh, 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 of the twelve spies that went in to spy out the land forty years earlier than what than the than what we're talking about here. Ten of the spies could see everything on the natural. It was all natural. We can't take that land. I mean, those giants are in the land, and the and the walls are big, and we're not gonna. Well, you know what? If you're looking from down on the hill, looking up, yep. That we are at a big disadvantage. We ain't going to make it. But Joshua and Caleb was looking from heaven down and going, these guys are easy. Because they're looking for, from up on top of the hill, looking down. They said, we got an advantage. We're from the vantage point. And after 40 years, you know, and God says, you know what? If I can't get this you're going to battle this, this thing. You're going to take the promised land through earthly means. I can't deliver it into your hands because I'm, I'm not into the earthly means. I'm into the spiritual means of getting things done. Amen. So the way we're going to conquer the things in our life, it's going to have to come from the spirit realm and not the physical. Amen. You know, our, our health comes from heaven. Our, 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 uh, our prosperity comes from heaven. It doesn't come from this physical plane. If you limit yourself to that, then thieves will break in and steal. Moths will eat. Rust will corrupt. <laughs> we get it from heaven. Where moths can't eat. Thieves can't break in. And I tell you, there's lots of thieves here on this earth. They're just wringing their hands waiting for you. <laughs> Amen. I love it. That's the way Jesus operated in prosperity. I mean, when he needed to meet 5,000, they looked at the money bag and went, there ain't no money in there that's going to do that. And Jesus says, well, my, my treasure's in heaven. Boop. Fed 5,000 people. Didn't take a dime out of the money bag. Amen. Well, we got to pay some taxes, Peter. Go down there and go fishing. Yeah, going out of the fish's mouth. If that, whatever it takes, because the kingdom of when you get it from the kingdom of God, it's endless, boundless. Thieves can't break in and steal. Rust can't corrupt. Amen. That's awesome, isn't it? And if Joshua was going to take the promised land, it was going to have to happen from the spirit realm. So how is he going to lock him into this? How is he going to keep him prosperous in what God has called him to do? How is he going to do that when you're being faced by the physical realm that's telling you, no way, no way, no way, no way? God says, i got to get your eyes off that, even though Joshua wasn't hard to convince because he was convinced 40 years prior. But listen to what he does, and this is a lesson unto us. Joshua 1, 1, 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Now, this is right after Moses died, and now this 
Moses' responsibilities now have been passed on to Joshua, and Joshua's now thinking, how am I going to fill these sandals? Because Moses is like, wow. If there ever was a kingdom man, it was, jo I mean, Moses. He was a kingdom thinker, wasn't he? He lived in the kingdom of God. He lived in the spiritual realm. He was in total contact with God all the time. He thought kingdom, kingdom, kingdom all the time. Now here's Joshua here to fill that responsibility. So God's got to instill in him the ability to be kingdom-minded, to stay engaged with the kingdom of God so he can continue to flow in the miracles that Moses flowed in, that Joshua could flow in these things, because the only way that they're going to obtain the promised land is through the kingdom, not flesh and blood. So here's what God's instructed to Joshua. Be strong and have good courage. Now, right off the bat, I say that what he's telling him is, don't be fearful, kingdom of darkness. I want you to be in faith, kingdom of God, so that I can flow through you, my power can be accomplished, and we can get this done supernaturally. Not of earthly means, but of spiritual means. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide all the inheritance of the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Again, he reiterates, only be strong and, a very, uh, and be very courageous. He re re reiterates that again. Why? Because I can't afford you to walk in any fear, none. Because if there's any kingdom of darkness here, I'm not going to be able to deliver you. I'm not going to be able to help you. So you're going to have to stay in faith. Stay strong, stay courageous, stay trusting me, stay engaged with the kingdom of God. This is a spiritual warfare. This is not a physical warfare. You can't do this in the physical. It's got to be done. Your warfare is where? It's in the spirit realm. You're going to have to take captive your imagination. You're going to have to throw it down, and you're going to have to, anything that exalts itself against what I've promised you and, and, and flowing in the... You got to cast that, cast the, any any contradiction down, and jerk it into obedience to what I've told you. Stay encouraged, stay engaged. And how, he, now he's going to instruct him: How do I accomplish that, God? How am I going to keep that? Only be strong and very courageous, for that you may observe to do according to all the law in which. Moses, my servant, commanded you, do not turn from the right or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. That's the end game. I want you to prosper in everything you touch. And it's going to take courage and strength. It's going to take you in staying engaged with me. This is his answer. Here's his weapon. This is what he instructs him to do. This book of the law, or the words that I've instructed you, shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate on it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then, for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. What is the, what is the formula for staying engaged? You're going to have to keep his word in your mouth and be meditating it on day and night. It's going to take you meditating on what God has said, what He's instructed in His Word. Amen. We need to meditate on this day and night, not just Sunday morning, not just a little devotional in the morning from our daily bread. Amen. Little min mini, you know, uh, Sher Sheris and I, you know, in the mornings we have our we have our um, Rick Renner, you know, comes uh, into our email. We, we read our Rick Renner and our Kenneth Copeland. Um, uh, Chris Cree sends a devotional out every morning. We have our little devotionals that we read through and stuff. Oh, honey, isn't this really good? And we'll talk about it and all that kind of stuff. But if that's all it ever was, is that was our, our, the level in which we, you know, meditated on God's Word and stuff, if that was the level and that was it, the catch-all of our entire day, we're in trouble. 
Because the rest of the time, the earth is med uh, ministering to you fear, destruction, not going to make it. You're up the creek. Huh? You got to continue that meditation in the word. You got to stay on it. He said, you do it day and night. Day and night, night and day, let incense rise. <laughs> Woo, man. <laughs> Amen. We've got to stay on it. That's the only way you're going to be strong and of good courage. Are we getting a revelation here today? Man, I'm telling you, this is something that's continuous. But I'll tell you what, as you do it and commit yourself to it, you're thinking, well, how can I do that? I mean, I got to work a job. I got to do this. Well, I'm not talking about where you got to be in a closet 24-7, you know. We're going to talk about what meditation is and what it ain't. Well, that's not what we're talking about. And, and, and we'll get into that. I don't, want, I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but the secret that God gave them in order for them to be strong and have a good courage was that it took meditation and it took them talking it out their mouth. There was talking. And, and now look in verse 9. He says, Have I not commanded you, not optioned it to you, commanded you, be strong and of good courage, do not what? Be afraid. The end game here is that I don't want you falling into the kingdom of darkness, putting your faith in the still kill and destroy, in the giants, in the, in the big walls you're going to encounter, or the big armies that are going to come at you. That's not what you're going to meditate on. You're going to meditate on the fact that I am with you. I am the one that's delivering this into your hands. Had I not already promised this to you? Have I not already delivered this into you? Did I not part a sea? Did I not deliver you from Egypt? Did I not feed you with, with quail coming down out of the sky every day and manna from the ground during, during the day? Did, did I not cause water to come out of rocks and whatnot? Then what wall like this is going to stand up against you? Have not the enemies that you've already conquered, did I not supernaturally destroy them to where you did not lost not one guy? Amen. So who cares how tall people are? <laughs> Come on. Amen. And yet 10 spies were turned over by that. That's ridiculous. And to Joshua and Caleb was like, are you people insane? We've got God on our side. And they're going, yeah, but they got giants on their side. Really? So meditating and speaking work together. Thinking about and saying it. Think about it and say it. Think about it and say it. Speak the word out loud over and over, letting God paint a picture on the inside of you of what the word promises. You got to talk about it. Talk about it. Yeah, but you know, this is happening and that's happening. So what? I've got this advantage and this advantage and God said this and, and he's my redeemer and, and, and if, this is only for a little while anyway because he's coming back to receive us. I mean, come on, the signs are right there. How much time do we have left, really? You can endure anything for a little time. Amen. No matter how rough it gets. It's only for a season. And you talk about this all the time. And, then, and, and so whenever you hear something on the news or hear something like that, you brush it off and go, yeah, it's just one more sign. Woo-hoo, we're coming, we're going on home, hon. That's the way we respond to things. We don't go, oh, my gosh, what are we going to do if they pass that bill? It don't matter. <laughs> In fact, we look at it as like, pass it. That's just one more day closer to Jesus' return. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but that doesn't come by watching CNN all day long and going, what are we going to do? Ah, we're going to die. No. We're, we're, we're in the Word and being encouraged by the Word and meditating that and talking about that. That's awesome. That's how you have courage and be strong. Man. I'll tell you, I believe really uh, for 40 years 
Joshua and Caleb kind of being the only guys that are walking in faith. I believe that every, every evening they got together, had a campfire out there in the desert, and they would talk across the fire at each other. Man, I can't wait to get them giants. I can't wait to knock those walls down. I can't wait to take that promise. For 40 years, they encouraged one another. They talked about it. They meditated on it. All they could think about was that we're going in that promised land. He got so explosive that Caleb, they're, now they're 80 years. Now, look, Josh is, Joshua was 80 years old here. I mean, they are decisively twice the age of anybody else in Israel right now. And so is Caleb. And Caleb goes to Joshua and goes, I want the hill country where them giants were. And Joshua goes, go get them. And he did. He'd been meditating and talking about them giants for 40 years. I want them. Amen. Where's some prime real estate them giants had? That hill country with all the timber? Oh, yeah. It was a heavily timbered area there. It was a very desirable place to have because that's building material. That's a, that'd be a wealthy piece of land. And that's why the giants had it. I mean, they took the prime real estate because they're the big boys. Mm -hmm. You whoop the big boys, you get their big, their big profits. Amen. God says, man, you're going to live in cities and walled cities and furnished houses that you didn't build and furnish. You're going to eat crops you didn't plant. Amen. So everybody meditates and speaks every day. Do you know you already practice that? We do. Man, how am I going to pay my bills? That's meditation. <laughs> and you're speaking it. Honey, look at this. I mean, whew, that was unexpected. I mean, what are you supposed to do with this? And then that night, you're rolling around in your bed going, how are we going to pay that? How am I going to pay that? Oh, Lord, how are we going to do this? You're operating in the principle already. You just need to learn how to operate in it in the kingdom of God instead of the kingdom of darkness. We're well trained to operate in that in the kingdom of darkness, worrying and stressing. And how am I going to do it? Oh, my gosh. And the whole time, God's got it, got it covered. Yeah. He's just waiting for you to put some faith out there and receive it. I remember there was a time when uh, I got, a, I got a, a ticket going through a red light. And I, and, and I did. I was busted. I couldn't argue with the cop. I was redheaded and busted, man. And uh, at this time, our kids were really small. And, well, I mean, I knew I was busted because I was following my wife, and she ran the red light, and I pushed through it just to follow her in the other car. So, because uh, the cop said, well, I would have pulled that car over if it weren't for that you rode, or rode the bumper of that car right through the light. Well, he didn't know it. it was my wife. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but another thing he was going to write me up on was that uh, uh, I had paid my, tick, uh, paid my um, license, license tags, yes. And so, uh, but the, st the sticker had not come in and it had lapped. <clears throat> and then this guy had an attitude. I mean, he was just on, an, he was not, I, I was breaking into his donut break. I don't know what it was, but he was upset. He was upset with me, right? And, and this was late. It was like 11 o'clock at night. I mean, we had been at the church. We'd been doing something with kids ministry and all that kind of stuff. So we were late getting home. And uh, so he was writing me up for that. I said, now, look, if you get on your computer, you'll find out I really did pay that. The sticker just isn't on the license plate. He says, I don't care if it's not on the license plate, you're getting fined. That fine was bigger than me running the red light. And money was tight back in them days, amen? Yeah, they were. So I decide, well, I'm just going to go ahead and fight it in court. Man, uh, uh, six weeks of rolling around in bed going, oh, God, I should have just paid it. I'm so worried. Oh, no, what am I going to do? You know, I just, I don't want to go to court and face a judge, you know. Well, then the day came, and on the, license, on the ticket it said, you know, that I'm to appear. Uh, uh, it was like 7 o'clock or 9 o'clock, I think it was, at night. Because it looked like it was circled the 9, 9 p.m. Or the, the, you know, the, the p.m. part was circled by the, by the 9. And I'm like going, oh, well, it must be night court I got to appear at. So I go to the courthouse, and I go, well, you don't have night court here. You are supposed to come in the morning. I'm thinking, oh, my God, I missed my court. I'm going to jail. 
I'm going to jail. Here we go. I'm going to jail because I missed my, I didn't show up in court, man. Now I'm really tossing and turning. Oh, God, I should have just paid the ticket. Oh, my, yeah. I went on and on and on about that. I get up the next morning bright and early. I mean, I hit the doors as they open there at the courthouse. I go up to the lady at, at the counter, you know, and said, well, I missed my court date yesterday. I misunderstood it, and I handed it to her, and I'm waiting for them to come and arrest me. Put me in a, in a you know, in a jumpsuit, you know. And she goes, huh. She goes, the uh, judge said that... Uh, what, 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 what the, the guy had done, instead of circling, he had, it was supposed to be an X, but he was so, I don't know what his problem was, he made a sloppy X, and it looked like he circled. And the judge looks at it, and he goes, I'd be confused by this ticket, too. Dismissed. <laughs> she goes, oh, the judge dismissed the whole thing. Man, I'm like, ho, oh, ho, oh, oh, you know, I'm about ready to fall on the floor, you know. God had it the whole time. Man, I'm telling you what. You know, we need to just stick with God. Stick with the kingdom of God. Quit fussing over that stuff. Trust Him. Amen. And I'll tell you what I learned through that was I ain't worrying about stuff like that no more. Let it, let, you know, bring it on, whatever it is. Just bring it on. I, I'm sticking with God on that thing. God, God will take care of it. He's, I ain't worried. I'm going to bed and I'm, take, I'm going to sleep sound tonight. I ain't fussing over it. And I tell you what now, I mean, no matter what we face, I don't stay up all night long worrying about stuff. And sure enough, it's taken care of. It's not a problem. So don't operate in the kingdom of darkness and worry and toss and turn. I mean, you know how to do it. You know how to worry and talk about it and fret over it and blah, 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 blah. Just shut up. Find out what the Word says and start talking that. Amen. That's how it works. You already know the operation of it. You just got to flip it. So it's called complaining, murmuring all day long, whining about stuff in your life and all that kind of stuff. Shut it off. Look, if you don't have anything good to say, just shut up. You'd be better off just keeping your big trap shut. It's your worst enemy. Yapping and yapping things. Because you're speaking from the abundance of your heart, and from the abundance of your heart, your what? Mouth speaks. So you know what's in your heart when you get the, get the blab in your mouth here. Speak from what the Word says, and Joshua gained a whole new perspective of meditating on what God said instead of meditating on what the circumstances were. Huh. So if you talk to yourself, you're not crazy. Just be aware of what you're talking about and the words that you're saying. This is important, isn't it? This is the God-given ability just to be aware of what you're saying is what's important, isn't it? So meditating is saying that you may observe to do. Who would have thought of what you meditate on and what you talk about is what's going to cause you to do? Because you're going to do what you meditate and talk about. It's going to push you into that direction. The ten spies meditated on, we're all going to die by the giants. And that pushed them to say, I ain't crossing that Jordan River. Mm -mm. I don't care how good those grapes look. I ain't going to partake if I got to face a giant. Meditating gives boldness and action to the Christian life. Amen. Because you'll be courageous and strong. Look at Joshua 2.8. So they go ahead and send spies in there. And we find out what the inhabitants of the land was meditating on the whole time. Forty years they've been meditating. In fact, they've been meditating not longer than that. Watch this. Joshua 2.8, the spies 
They go into the land to check it out. And they're up on a roof. And Rahab is, is hiding them out there because they've been discovered in the city. And uh, so that's the setting we're at. And it says, now before they laid down up on the roof, she came up to them on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land. What has she been meditating on? <laughs> she goes, I know that I know that I know that you guys are the winners. You guys, this land is yours. That the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. Well, how's that? For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two, two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. Now, I think it's fascinating that the Israelites didn't look at this situation and go, we can whoop them. The Israelites, or the, the people in the Jordan, over the other side of the Jordan, were on the other side going, look what God's done for them. We're going to get whipped. That's amazing to me. And as soon as we heard these things, when did they hear those things? Forty years earlier, when they crossed through the Red Sea, they were already meditating on, we're doomed. We've had it. Oh, no. What are we going to do? See what meditation does to you? They were already defeated in their brains before the Israelites even crossed the desert. They knew they're coming for us. That's the power of meditating. And it says, And our hearts melted, neither did they remain any more courage, uh, uh, courage in anyone because of you. Uh, anyone would cover the giants. The giants were scared, spitless. When we, these people cross the land, we are dead meat. I don't care how big we are, we've had it. No matter how big you are in the physical realm, if you're meditating on your defeat, you're defeated. You're done. I don't care how big your bank account is, how much influence you have, I don't care anything you have, as soon as you get the mindset, we're toast. You might as well get the butter out because you're about to get buttered, you're toast. <laughs> All that's left is the greasing down. And that's what they were waiting for. If you read Numbers, the book of Numbers, man, they were terrified. They had Balaam come and curse the people because we ain't going to be able to feed them. See, they were spiritually minded. Too bad the Israelites weren't thinking spiritually minded. They were physically minded. That's it. Seems incredible to me, but we can fall trapped to that, can't we? As much revelation as we have, we fall trapped to that as well. For the Lord your God, listen to her declaration, for the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Wow. A heathen across the Jordan has got a revelation that you've got a God on your side that we can't defeat. We're toast, and that's the end of us. If only the other ten spies had that idea. But instead, when Joshua and Caleb stand up and go, now wait a minute here, we've got them hands down. This is going to be easy. They wanted to stone them for saying that. Wow. And I tell you what, when you walk by faith, you're going to have some brothers and sisters who are going to want to stone you. They're not going to want to hear your faith. You're showing me up. You're making me, you know, feel, well, you're making it sound like I don't have any faith. Yeah. But you can join me. You can join the word. You can get into this kingdom thing here. Come on. Amen. Rather than join them, have them join you. So the whole time the giants felt like, felt like uh, grasshoppers up next to the Israelites. And yet the Israelites were meditating on, we're grasshoppers up next to them, and they think we're grasshoppers. No, the whole time they were meditating on, we're grasshoppers, and here they come. The giants felt like grasshoppers the whole time. Isn't that something? 
So don't think that the circumstances around you is, is, is uh, built against you. Actually, if you stay kingdom-minded, you'll get a revelation of, no, everything's stacked in your favor. And they know it. The devil knows it. That's why when somebody knows who they are in Christ and they come into a room where there's demons, the demons cry out. Oh, no. We've had it. We're grasshoppers. We're going to get defeated here. Oh, no. You got to think this way. Amen. This is important. Psalms 1, Psalms 1, verse 1. Psalms 1, verse 1. Blesses the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Why do you ever want to be counseled by those that are of the earth? They're not kingdom-minded. They're not spiritually-minded. They walk in the counsel of the ungodly. They sit in the paths of the sinners and sit in the seat of the scornful. But, he, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he what? Meditates day and night. He's meditating on what God said. Not what the scornful say, not what the, the sinners say. That's why you got to turn off CNN. You got to turn off ABC and all these, these sinners and all these. Yeah, that's right. I'm getting bold here. It's called, it's called a mule, a mule. Because they're all, well, jacks. Jacked. <laughs> So we need to be med meditating day and night in the things of God, not the things of this world. What's the benefit of it? He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and wherever he goes, or whatever he does, it shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind blows away. Have we not been witnessing this? How many want to be chaff? How many feel like they've been chaff? We need to change that, don't we? Feels like we're just getting blown away by everything that comes down the road here. We don't have to be subject to that. If we delight in God's Word and meditate on it day and night, then it will be like a tree planted by a river, having a never-ending source of nourishment. When... Uh, Years ago, we had a drought up here. And I mean, it's the middle of the summer. And I mean, the grass is brown. Everything's brown. I mean, it was, it was bad. In fact, we ended up with a big fire up here. Boulder Canyon fire, you know, and, and burned a bunch of anchorage. In fact, Woodland Park was so threatened that uh, they were starting to evacuate. And there was so much smoke that we couldn't see the house across the street. It was that thick. We were loading up our trailer and all of our, with all our stuff so we could get out of town, you know see what we're going to save. And it was coming over the mountain of where our house is backed up to. So, I mean, we're like, I'd be the first ones to lose it. And as we're driving out of town, we're going, man, this is awesome. If our house burns down, then we can just build another one to our dream specifications. <laughs> That's the way we were talking. God's going to give us sevenfold what we lost. We weren't like chaff being blown away. We were excited. Actually, in fact, we were kind of disappointed when they put the fire out and we went back to our old house. <laughs> um, I, I guess this is okay. We were dreaming about the house we were going to build to replace it. <laughs> now, that's the difference between meditating in the things of God and being earthbound. Are you hearing what I'm saying here? This is important for us to know. But that drought was so bad that, like I said, man, the fields of just nothing but dead grass and everything else. And I remember driving up the mountain one day, and we got to, you know, just short of, of where um, uh, uh, Walmart is and all that kind of stuff. And I looked off to the left, uh, off, off to my left, and there's, a, there's a, a stream that runs down the mountain there, you know. And along there is just all kinds of trees. 
along that stream. And those trees were just as green. I mean, they really stood out against all the brown. And they were just as green and leafy and beautiful. And as I contemplated that, I thought about this scripture right here. How when you're planted by the water, by the river of water, that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaves also shall not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. Those trees were prospering because they were by a source. And you know what? When we meditate on his word night and day, when we stick in the kingdom of God, when we're in faith in him, then while everybody else is blowing away, we are green and leafy and a testimony of the kingdom. Amen. We are a fortress under that. And we're going to talk about fortresses in another Sunday but brings forth fruit in its season. You keep meditating and you're bearing fruit and prospering when you stay hooked to the kingdom of God through meditating His Word day and night and talking about it. Praise God that I got a spouse that likes talking about the Word. Man, it's a dynamic thing. It's exciting. We love digging in the Word together. That brings stability to our lives, doesn't it? We don't have to be up and down. One day we're like going, Woo, man, God is awesome. And the next day we're going, Where's God at us? And we're just like, No, if you're meditating in the Word, it stables things out for you. Stables things out. Especially if you've got a spouse, you can talk about the Word and that. Because when I'm down, she's up and she's telling me, Hey. Then I go, Yeah, you're right. Got to get back my, got to get my mind back on the Word and back and forth, right? Amen. That's a, that's a benefit. It's a real benefit. But we have to press in and meditate day and night on the Word to begin this benefit. We've got to press in. We've got to be conscious of it. We don't have time to meditate in the Word that much. Oh, really? You know, got time to worry. You got time to fret and have anxiety. You can sit there at your computer at work and go, I ain't got time to meditate the Word. Man, how am I going to get my car fixed? It just broke down, and we're going to go down the tubes, and I'm going to do it. Oh, I need some overtime. Blah, 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 blah. You just met, you're, there you are meditating while you're working. Seems like you can meditate on the things of God while you're working. Uh, what do you think? You just got to change your thinking, what you're thinking on. Because your mind's always going, 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 going and going. You just got to train yourself to meditate on the right thing, don't we? So let's talk about meditation, what it's not. <laughs> meditate, because there, there's a lot of confusion about what's meditation? What is that? You know, mind over matter. I don't mind over matter. Now, that's not to say that your mind doesn't matter. It matters what you're thinking about. But it's not about mind over matter. You need to renew your mind to walk in the ways of God. Not a matter of, okay, I'm going to think, I'm going to think, I'm going to think, and things are going to just change. I'm going to think. and It's not mind over matter. You need to renew your mind to walk in the ways of God. The power of the Christian life does not come from the mind, but it comes through a renewed mind in the Word. Amen. It's what you think on that's going to produce in your life and what you're meditating on with this is going to make the difference. Amen. It's not a New Age philosophy. The New Age have robbed truth. <laughs> the devil has hijacked the truth of the things of God. Twist them slightly to deceive you. New Age teachers of the power of meditating and speaking to your obstacles. Jesus said, speak to the mountains. You see, they look very familiar. They look very free. I mean, very much like the same thing. But when you're meditating on the situation and trying to picture it being changed versus God's word says this, and that's what changes it. Do you see the difference? It's God that changes us, not my mental ability. Live long and prosper. <laughs> That's not what does it. 
It's meditating on Him and His Word that changes things, not you just meditating on things. So there's a little twist in their philosophy, isn't there? It's godly principles giving glory to man and not God is what New Age does. And then you say, look what I did, instead of that's what my father did. That's the difference. It's not memorization. Meditating in deep thought on the principles that are being taught and apply them to your lives, not just committing words to memory. I mean, there are people that have the whole Bible memorized. You can quote a scripture and they can tell you, you can say, uh, Deuteronomy 3.16, and boom, they can tell you what it is. Yet they don't have no relationship with God whatsoever. They got a whole phone book. All right, page 32, five lines down. Well, that's Thomas, you know, Edison, uh, and that, this is his phone number and address. It's amazing how these people have that ability, yet it, it, it profits them nothing. It's not about memorizing the Word of God, though that is an excellent step towards, er, towards meditation, memorizing and then meditating on it. But just, just being able to quote the Word isn't enough. You need to meditate the Word until it becomes a part of you on the inside so that you can activate it by faith, not from the head. So it's not just memorization. That's not necessarily meditation. So what is meditation? And we'll talk about that next week. No, I'm just playing with you. <laughs> meditation, what is it? Don't leave you hanging for a whole week. A Bible truth with rich benefits. We need to search the word concerning the situation that we're in. Because that word within itself is like a seed. And it has the power within that seed. Just like a seed you plant in the ground, it has the power to germinate and create a whole tree. The Word of God has a, it is like a seed. It has the power within itself to come to pass and do whatever that Word says it will do. And you need to meditate on it to get it to germinate, to water it, to take care of it, to bring it to pass, to get an image on the inside. You can see what the Word is saying, and that Word can take care of any situation that that Word is directed at. And remember, meditation is not just meditating or thinking on that, but it's talking to it. Amen. A way of, it's a way of life for the Christian. It's just not an exercise when you're in trouble. Oh, no. I just, I've come across this situation, and so i got to get out my book of prayers and, and confession scriptures. Okay, look up the category of finances. Here it is. We're going to start confessing this. You need to do that before you're in a crisis. So it's already rooted and grounded on the inside of you. That meditation should already be there, and that confession should already be in your mouth so that when a situation happens, your natural knee-jerk reaction isn't, we're all going to die. Our natural knee-jerk reaction is, by His stripes we're healed. Thank you, Jesus, when you get the report from the doctor. Amen. Man, that's important. See, when you're flowing in a meditation like that and you're keeping your eyes stilled on the things of God, you flow in a, in a whole different way of thinking. Can I embarrass Deb today? All right, she's got broad shoulders. When, when Alan died, her husband, all right, I was in the hospital room. I was the only one in the hospital room when he died. and. Uh, she and Sheriff had just pulled into the, into the parking lot when I text them and says, Alan just coded, you know, and they can't bring him back, you know. And so they ran on into the hospital, and uh, they, they, they let Debbie come in because they just, you know, when something like that happens in the ER or whatever, they just cut it. They just shut all the doors and lock them, you know. Nobody can come in or out or whatever, but they let her come in. 
And when she got, I mean, you know, some of the doctors and the nurses, they were distraught. They were like, going, he was doing so well. I don't understand why he didn't remember. And this one nurse was crying. She was just beside herself. And Deb goes up to her, puts her arms around her, goes, it's okay, it's okay. It's her husband that died. And she's ministering to the nurse who's distraught. That doesn't come on the fly. That doesn't come, okay, uh, I better get out my, my scriptures. <laughs> you got to already have them sewn. You got to already be meditated. You got to already be talking. You already got to be operating in this before the crisis hits. Come on now. Amen. This is why it's a lifestyle for a Christian to be doing this. It's our lifestyle to do this. It's not a hobby. It's not a only when you're in crisis or only when you need something. It's something that you do continuously in your life so that when something arises, you have the armor, you have the, the tools to get her done. Amen. And you're not shaken. You're already a fortress. So this is, so is that not very important? Amen. Man, that was a testimony to me when I, I'm like going, has anybody seen this but me? <laughs> you know, everybody else is running around going, oh my God, you know, and all this. Guy. And she's over there comforting a nurse that's cr literally crying over this situation. Amen. Wow. Uh, it's forever burned in my mind <laughs> what I witnessed that day. It was a testimony unto me that we don't wait until the crisis hits. We are already established, right? It's already established in our hearts. It's a form of prayer and communication with God, not humming in a corner. <laughs> it's spending time with God and having a relationship with Him and praying in the Spirit and build, having that relationship with Him. It's not sitting in the corner going, mm, um, that's not it. It's relationship with God. That's, that's what meditation is. It's to ponder, deep thought, thinking on things with a purpose, on purpose. In Psalms 3, 5, you don't have to turn there. I'll just read it to you. Psalms, I'm sorry, <laughs> 8, 3. <laughs> Amen. I consider your heavens and the works of your fingers and the moon and the stars in which you have ordained. What, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. It's in those times of quiet contemplation that you get the best revelation, isn't it? Amen. Now, I might correct the translation of this. We're not a little lower than the angels. That's Elohim, the word angels there, which was translated every other place in the, in the Old Testament as God. I think the monks just did not have the stomach to think that we are a little lower than God. The king might have our heads. We better put an angel in there. <laughs> Boy, a little politics there. A little lower than God. And to contemplate that, you have crowned him with glory and with honor. And here, here's David. He's contemplating this and it's filling his heart with courage. It's filling his heart with how big God is. And this big God is my, my friend. I have a relationship with him. How can I fail? Giant? Ha, 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 ha. Big deal, giant. He's a piece of cake. As a kid, we're talking a 17-year-old kid going, not a problem. What's the matter with you guys hiding in these rocks, man? You got, you have the army of heaven at, at your beck and call here. That's what David's meditating on while he's out there with the sheep, killing lions and killing bears and, ooh. Muttering is a form of meditation. In fact, the very definition of meditation is to mutter, to speak. 
So it's okay that when you're meditating and, and something in the Word, talk about it. Speak it. Talk to God about it. Talk to yourself about it. Talk to your spouse about it. Rolling those things of the Word of God around on the inside of you and talking. You feel that somebody says, that guy's talking to himself. It's godly. You need to talk to yourself. Man, that's what the Word says, and I'm believing it. God, you're awesome. It's okay to do that. So, well, that guy's crazy. Well, you don't think he's crazy when he's kicking his car because it's stalled out, and you're going, this is a piece of junk. Well, like that car's going to respond to you. Huh? We don't think that's crazy. We talk to God. We talk to, when we talk to our car, you're a good car. You never break down. You're awesome, man. These tires are going to last three times longer than they normally do. And this car never breaks down. People will go, man, that guy's crazy. No, I'm speaking life into that automobile. Is that possible? Well, the Israelites walked 40 years in the desert and their shoes never wore out and their clothes never wore out. I, man, psh, I can drive this car for 50 years and it's going to be a cherry. This car's getting old. It's, listen to yourself. Well, you know, it's 10 years old. We're probably going to have to trade it in. It's going to start breaking down. Well, if you say so, yeah, it's probably going to Next thing you know, here it goes. How'd that happen? See, I told you. Mm-hmm. There you go. Did you get anything today? Amen. 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 So to stay on the kingdom of God side is to meditate on the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God stuff. But if you want to have the kingdom of darkness operating in your life, then meditate on that and mutter and complain and stand on the side of that. Because whatever you're meditating on and, 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 and speaking out of your mouth and see, you on purpose can determine what kingdom you're going to stand in. And so this is one of the keys to standing in the kingdom of God. One of the keys to the kingdom is you that, that you mutter and meditate and the things of God. And it will keep you from the kingdom of darkness. Falling trap to that. Amen. Father, we thank you and praise you for your revelation because we want to. As your disciples and as your children, we want to learn how to stay on the God side of things, on your side. We want to stay locked into the kingdom of God in which you've made us a prince so that we can function and represent the kingdom of God in this earth effectively the way you've meant us to function and not slip off into the kingdom of darkness and allow fear and worry and anxiety to trigger destruction into our lives. It's your desire that we stay on your side and in your kingdom so that we can be victorious in you, Lord. We thank you and praise you for the revelation of how to stay connected to you. And we're excited about learning other things in your word, revelations in your word of how to stay hooked to you and stay keep a kingdom of God mindedness so that we can walk in victory, representing your kingdom the way you want it represented in the name of Jesus. Amen. And if there's anybody that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, that would like to be able to enter into the kingdom of God and stay in the kingdom of God, amen, and not be wishy-washy and flipping from one kingdom to the other. If anybody here that wants to be born again and have a relationship with God, that's where it all begins. It begins with knowing who Jesus is knowing that he has paid the redemptive cost for your sin. If you're waiting to become perfect before you can present yourself to God, it ain't never going to happen because in and of yourself, you can't do that. That's why Jesus had to come. He paid the price for your sins, and then you just receive him as a substitute sacrifice for all the sins so that you can walk in righteousness and holiness before him so that you can, he took our sin so we can take his righteousness. So you can have an intimate relationship with God. Because eternal life is about knowing the Son and He who sent Him. To have an intimate relationship with Jesus and the Father. That's what it's all about. It's not about, you know, rules and regulations and get, doing the club handshake and all that in order to be part of an organization called the church so that you can rub elbows with a bunch of moral people. It's not about that. It's about having a, a personal relationship with the living and true God. 
Amen. And all you have to do is believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. He's not dead in his grave. He rose from the dead. When he paid for your penalty in hell, he rose back up victoriously. And that very Savior you're making Lord of your life. So you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. God is Lord of my life. You make him Lord. You make him supreme ruler of your life. And you become his disciple. And he's become your master. And you spend the rest of your life learning the things of God and learning how to walk more victorious in the kingdom of God like what we're learning here today. But the starting point is having a relationship with that master. And it starts with receiving what he's already done for you so that you can walk in his righteousness, walk in his holiness, be able to have this fantastic time with him. Oh, it gets me out of hell. That's just a side the benefit from getting saved. Yeah, you're saved from hell, but that's not the focus. The focus is having a relationship with God. This isn't about fire insurance. It's about having an intimate relationship with Him. That's the end game. That's what He's after. Having children unto Himself. Ones that He can have a loving, personal relationship with. That's what, our, that's what all this is about. And he's desired to have that with you. So if there's anybody that would like to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, just raise up your hand. I'd like to have that intimate relationship with him. Maybe you at home are watching this and you would like to have that intimate relationship. I know I can't see you, but go ahead and raise your hand. Make that declaration with your hand that you want to have an intimate relationship with him. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm not going to ask you to repeat after me, you know, some special code to get you into the kingdom of God. I want you to, if you're going to have a relationship with God, you start with just addressing him right now. Just go before God and say, tell him what you want. I want to have a relationship with you. And I thank you that Jesus paid for my sins and I received that. And now I want to have an intimate relationship with you. I, I, I want to start building this, this intimacy and if you move towards him, he moves towards you. Amen. It's really that simple. This is not, not super science, having a relationship with God. It's very, very simple. And that's all there really is to it. And just continue to stay in his word and read his word and find out what his will is and what he loves and what he doesn't love. Begin to understand his character. And as you pray, and as you have a relationship with him, it's going to become more and more apparent the things that he loves, the things he doesn't so much. And that relationship grows on the inside of you to where you're so focused on him, having that relationship, that wanting to do the old things you used to do just kind of, just kind of sloughs off. It's not even a chore to try to break old habits. Because you just like going, Man, I'm so focused on you, the old habits aren't even appealing to me anymore. It's really that easy. It's really that simple. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And if you've received the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, go to curiousfamily.org and send a little message and share with us what God's done in your life today. Amen. All right. Praise God. I think that's just what the Holy Spirit wants to share today. And I think, I think we're there, man. Amen. Well, you guys have an awesome week. And I make myself available up here if you need an agreement and prayer or anything like that. I'm, I'm here to, to pray with you and stand in agreement. But uh, you guys have an awesome week. And get excited, man. Things are opening up. And continue to confess it. Stores are opening. These masks are coming off. Throw away the gloves. We got our freedom back. Amen? Because the virus is dead. It's toast. It's over. We're not allowing that anymore in our lives. We're not, we're not tolerating anymore the kingdom of darkness trying to destroy us. We got our freedom back. We have our liberty back. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, you guys have a blessed week. And meditate the word. Amen. All right. God bless you. You're.
blessed and highly favored. God bless you.